All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming to the Legal and Policy Dev Room. We look at look at all the hardcore fans that are stayed in the audience because like we filled up. Yeah. Thank you for being here. <laughs> like the, the Van Sock was the only thing we were full for today. I actually had to flip the sign uh, to the full setting, uh, but uh, we're not full now. I think that's obvious. But we are th so thankful for those of you that stayed just to hear us at the final session. So I think we should. We did a lot of new things. There were one major new thing this year, um, and so if it's okay by everybody, I think we should start out with feedback on that. So debates. Did you like them? Did you know? Let's start with. Let's start. Wait. Let's start with hands. So raise your hand if you really liked them. Fifty percent. It's not like three quarters. Okay. Well, it would be easier to do this. Raise your hand if you really hated them. <laughs> okay, so two people really hated them. You didn't um, even have to do any. Raise your hand if Fontana. you're not sure whether you like. Raise your hand if you're not sure if you like them or not. I'm revising my answer. Okay, then then if you're not for people who are not sure, it's about a quarter. Yeah. Um, and then raise your hand if you really liked some, but you really disliked others. Oh, yeah, no. Okay, okay. So so uh, I think in full disclosure, we this was a real experiment. So we didn't know exactly how to organize them. I think we learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can see what works. I spent the entire day yesterday studying debate theory. <laughs> so, so I think with the with the assertion that the vast majority of the people in the room really liked them a lot, or really liked some of them, um, maybe we could go to the negative and have people give constructive feedback on what they would do. Sure. And then, why don't we trade mics and I'll let people ask questions? Do I, is that what you're asking for now? Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Then I don't have to run around with the Okay, the I see a raised hand. And I, I have something that, um, uh, a comment that was made on social media that I can read as well, that was in the negative, so. I, I like the format, but there were possibly too many of them, so it sort of got a little repetitive because the format was the same again and again and again. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't run as many again, but I'd definitely do them again. I feel like this sort of uh, scratched an itch for a lot of people because a lot of people want to debate after a talk often. And so this kind of solved that in a part. But I think, yeah, probably it went a bit too much in the other direction. So a mix of a few debates and a few talks and, and kind of on different subjects, that would be great. But I love the concept of some debate happening here and not like in the hallway. Cool. Okay, you here, then Kate. So I, I think the debates were very entertaining, but um, there was, uh, I think there's kind of a problem that uh, since the folks who participated are more on one side of the debate actually than the, when, when there's a need to represent the other side, it sort of becomes a caricature. So it would be maybe useful to have actual proponents of the other side participate, although it's kind of also a problem to sort of invite them to the lion's den to be like. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we really appreciate that. Uh, to be very frank about it, uh, there was a tremendous amount of effort done primarily by Tom. I actually uh, want to take a moment to ask, will somebody else uh, mic run for us for this session so Tom can yeah. be up here with us? Okay, yeah, he's, he says I, I'm mind. just going to echo his but, uh, so, but just to, but give me a second, Kate, I'll finish that other point. So, so yeah, we, we spent a tremendous amount of effort emailing people, begging them to be in the debates, begging them to be on various sides. We reached out to people who were on various sides, and we had a, we had a hard time filling some of them uh, on certain sides. Just a quick question. Uh, raise your hand if you didn't participate in a debate, but you totally would in the future. So, like, two, four, six, seven, eight. Okay, nine. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, echo the prior point. It, it would have been better if there was something more sincerely debating each side as opposed to people putting on a persona and then putting these big disclaimers up. I would probably have learned more. I want to read the negative feedback that we got on uh, social media just because I think it dovetails with it, which is dis dislike new debate format of the legal and policy room at FOSDEM. Informative sessions 
uh, with respect to less sensational things going on in legal and policy and FOSS replaced with rehashed conversations we've been having for months for entertainment. Glad my legal team isn't here, would waste their time. So can I, can I yeah. say something? Um, so I, I happen, I don't, I don't agree with that comment, but okay. I do think that, that um, I felt that there was too much, you know, you know this was good entertainment. But I, um, what I originally loved about this dev room was the more serious discussion of um, legal and policy issues. And um, this was, as someone said, you know, it kind of at times verged on caricature. And I, th I see how it's sort of fun. But um, to me, um, I mean, I'll just I, I state some, some other problems I had. Um, I thought that um, I think the format is somewhat exclusionary because I think only certain types of personalities are going to be likely to enjoy doing this kind of thing and be good at it. And so I think it's kind of much more exclusionary than, than general um, presentations are, which are exclusionary enough already. And I think that's something that should be borne in mind. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons we did this uh, is because we looked at the last few years of the, uh, of the dev room talks and we get the, we get rehashed, recycled submissions of the same thing every single year from the usual suspects. And we do a lot of effort to get the CFP to new places. To, and the CFP has like way too much text because I wrote it, like paragraphs saying like, we want people who haven't talked about policy before, please submit, et cetera, et cetera. But we haven't been getting that the last few years. And so we didn't want to just run the usual suspects giving all the same talks for yet another year. And that's why we did it this way. That's true. But I wrote the I, I I did not write that alone. But I wrote the uh, the I wrote the the, the two verbose stuff. That's what I did. One point. Um, I think a lot of the participants were what we would call usual suspects. That's one of the problems. So I'm glad that there are some people who are willing to um, maybe Same do debates mind. debates um, in you know future years. Um, so if we get you know additional people to do it who haven't spoken in the dev room before, I think that'd be great. Yeah. But I think that there were a lot of, I mean, uh, speakers that we really like, but, but they're, as Bradley would say, usual suspects. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that it's being a first year proposition that might happen, but go ahead, Pam. Yeah, so I was gonna say, and I'm, I'm saying this with my open source initiative board member hat on, that um, as we shared privately, I'll say publicly, that it was very um, difficult, it was very difficult for the OSI to sort of see our, see our, our mission sort of up for vote, first off with a, with a very clickbaity title that was negative towards us, and then, uh, and then as first conveyed to us that there was going to be sort of a vote on whether or not the open source definition is appropriate or not, which I, I just can't tell you how much angst that that created at the OSI. That, that, so it's maybe less clickbait. I appreciate that you didn't ask those questions. I appreciate very much that, at the, and I did like the questions you did ask was, did you learn something? Did you, I think those were appropriate but um, less clickbaity titles or, or sort of hanging people out to dry less on the titles would, uh, we would have appreciated that. Yeah, so what we had this year was like a mix of some, we, we did the general call like CFP for folks that would want to submit the debates and then we also created some of them and I think, um, I think we would have a heavier hand in, um, in constructing those in the future and it, for many reasons, including that. Um, so just actually building on Kate's comment from before that it's maybe preferable to have people who are actually taking, not, sorry, not just taking an opinion for the sake of having a debate, but actually hold that opinion as well. Um, I think the advantage of having it this way and actually putting or forcing people to take a specific um, position makes the debate less heated because sometimes it feels like if you have someone on the, on the panel who's actually holding an, a very controversial opinion, they will get attacked and it will really go, to, uh, go into that and you, you lose focus of the topic as such. So yes, I understand this is kind of a, you know, it, it turns into a caricature, maybe, but it also has the advantage of allowing a debate about it. What if the topics were more subtle? Um, Yes, I, I would have preferred that as well. Um, for some of them, I think I would have preferred them to be clearer um, on what, you know, what you're actually talking about and what the debate is going to be about. But yeah, they can be know, narrower. Th that's, not, that's not a format issue. That's more of a, like a phrasing issue. 
Yeah, we actually originally wanted to structure it going even further in a very traditional way that they do debates where you don't know what side you have to take. It's a coin flip, um, which is how debate tournaments usually run. You're given a, a policy issue and you're told what the policy issue is ahead, but not which side you have to take. And then the coin is flipped at the beginning and, they, and that's how you end up on either side. Um, basically, we couldn't get anybody to agree to that who was willing to debate. <laughs> so. If, if people could pass the mic around, and Tom, you could come up, because I feel like, so yeah. you can keep the mic where it is, and we'll pass that. it around, but Tom, you're not participating in the. Oh, this is, yeah. So you, you can keep that. I'll hand, it, yeah, I'll hand it right back. Um, so this kind of relates to what Miriam was saying, and probably also outs me as being my first time in the, the legal dev room. Um, but it, what I was thinking about was, there seems to be um, too much of an assumption of a base level of knowledge on in two different ways. One is I had no idea what people were debating about at times because the debate topic wasn't clearly well defined and then I would click on the description in the page and I'm like, this doesn't sound right. It sounds like people are actually talking about two different things. But something else is that the people in the audience, I, I got this impression earlier when somebody said, you know, what are the four freedoms, for example, and I'm lucky that I know some of this stuff but being somebody who has been out of the open source movement for a long time and coming back, you know, I'm like, ooh, I actually haven't thought about a lot of this stuff for a long time, and all of this really assumes a very high level of knowledge, and it prevents a lot of audience members, I think. I, I, I'm going to speak for a lot of other people, and I'm assuming. Um, it prevents us from being able to engage, really, because I, I have no idea what you're talking about sometimes. I think it's a really fair criticism. Um, we have kind of maybe enjoyed a lot of success in the dev room and by having a lot of legal geeks and policy people involved that, you know, really go deep on this. But what we missed, I think, and very much to your point, is that it's all, it, we kind of make a, we ha especially today i can tell from not just your question but many questions uh, that we're we have made a whole bunch of assumptions about uh a lot of things not just how copyright law in particular works but also some of the the decisions that have been happening that are influential and kind of how it will affect us and some of us you know think about this a lot and um and some of us don't, but in, and I think that that's, it's sort of like having an open source project that's newbie friendly, you know, where we have starter bugs and we have a way of getting involved. We need to have a better on-ramp to, to this and not just assume that everything is uh, easy. Yeah, and, and another thing that, that, that I've noticed happening, uh, and I really, it really didn't become clear to me until today, uh, or maybe, maybe yesterday when I was talking to some people, um, we, in this dev room, are kind of a victim of our own success in certain types of ways. Uh, we were the first, historically, we were the first dev room to not be about software development, which we're very proud of. Uh, this was, you know, Tom's idea basically was like, hey, we could have a dev room about this stuff and it's never been done before. Uh, that was, we're excited and now there are more than just us. We're not the only dev room now. Uh, uh, one of the reasons we always give up our, we don't do, try to do two days anymore is because community dev room has a lot of the talks now that we would usually have to do here because they weren't welcome in any other dev room. Uh, and I, got, I get the impression, and actually I've heard this from, spe from speakers and potential speakers, that there's like a, a, a career need to speak in this dev room. Like people need to speak in this dev room for their own career development. I, I mean, I was surprised by this. And a little bit, flat, I think I'm probably all flattered as, as organizers that, that's, that it's so important to be in this dev room speaking, but on the other hand, it kind of changes the nature to a certain extent. But I don't know if that's really true. Okay. I know that definitely we that. know of a person who believes that to be the case. I don't think it's true. I, don't, I, I think, think, I think, you, I can think have, you can have a very successful career without ever speaking in this <laughs> yeah. dev room. Yes. Um, I agree. I agree. Yeah, so, so from the very beginning, we, we conceived of this dev room as being an advanced one. And that was because, uh, you know, nine, eight, nine years ago, there were conferences, uh, free software, open source software conferences that had legal presentations, and they tended to be very kind of introductory. And we thought, well, there's, there's already conferences, like commercially kind of conferences around open source and free software, not really free software, open source, that are doing very introductory level legal stuff. Why don't we be the one that talks about things at a more advanced level? And we're not the only one now 
that does that, although I, we may be the, the, the only one that's kind of really open to the public, um, which is something. Um, one challenge I faced with some of the talk, with some of the debates was remembering what role people were supposed to have because I knew a few of them and you'd ask them to play a different role to normal. I don't know whether we could have had hats or personas up or color coding to help us and maybe also them remember which position they were trying to take in that debate. Uh, I thought about you know creating a web app or something that would show you where you were in the process and you know, what position people were taking and, you know, the dog ate my homework. You, you could even just have one slide on the screen with pictures of the participants and list which side they're on. That probably would help a lot. Or have them do sides of the screen. Yeah, yeah. I'll just, so we can remember. You can keep talking. More questions? Thank you, first. Um, it's really cool to see us experimenting with the dev room. I think this is my fourth or fifth time here, and this was definitely way different than the experience I've had other times. So um, I like that we're trying to iterate and improve and give new voices and give other people a chance to experiment with these positions. Um, I think, first, uh, I like it. I think we could do a little bit less of it. That would be like my first one, would be like have a few more traditional talks mixed with it. But you know, putting my advocacy hat on, uh, we're in the midst of like a very FUD-ridden cycle right now, and there's a lot of misinformation going around. And I actually felt more confused about the issues by the end of it because it was I, I don't know, and I'm like, a, I would consider myself a sophisticated, you know, person who studies these things, and it was, there were moments when I forgot, like, whether or not the speaker was, you know, there was a lot of context switching, so maybe, like, sticking to the guns a little more would be helpful, um, and it would be, I, it's hard for me to imagine, like, a brand new person to the dev room, but again, like, this is an advanced dev room in the assumption, so um, I am thankful that we do it. I think it would be cool to do a more of a balance of traditional and the mix and have the roles better delegated to. Um, and just, you know, I don't want to be the guy that says we shouldn't have fun in here. Like, it was cool to see everybody laughing. Uh, we need to laugh and we need to have some joy in the dark times, too. So thank you for bringing a little bit of levity to these times, too. I also want to, we, we can continue to talk about uh, the, the debates, but I also want to just make a, a shout out to our two collaboration sessions. We, I mean, I had the idea that, you know, because there are a lot of really smart people in this room, that we could brainstorm uh, ways of uh, addressing some, some issues. And I'm really glad that Atello and, and um, Nate came to talk about that. I apologize that, you know, the timing is short, 25 minutes is really short to, to address these things and I really applaud them for introducing these issues and, you know, and, um, and Nate proactively, you know, setting up a, a link for people to continue the discussion afterwards. So um, just a, uh, a question on that. Do people think that the idea of doing a collaboration session was a good idea? Okay, let me ask a different question. Um, well, the, discussion yeah, they were discuss the, the idea was for them to be more discussion sessions to, you know, put it, put it forth a, a problem statement of something that was happening in our community and maybe, you know, really just have an interactive session about how to address it. Um, and if you, I, you know, I, I guess, I, you know, instead of asking a question, I'll just maybe pass the mic around and, and have people share their thoughts about that, what that we could do differently, what you liked, what you didn't like, that sort of thing. So. And Kevin, you can say whatever it was that you were going to say. Yeah, I just wanted to make a last comment. comment on the debate topic. This is mostly for Bradley because he just said he did all this research. Um, when these kinds of debates are held, what is the expectation for the audience knowledge level? That so, might be an issue here is if people didn't already have the background knowledge of the topic that was being discussed, then you just jumped right into the debate. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need two minutes 
from an introduction to just say this is a current topic of discussion. Here are some situations that are going to be debated okay. or something like that. So I think there might be something wrong on the mic because it sounds like you're not mic. So I just wanted to make sure. I, I heard the question. I'm going to repeat it just in case. So the question was like, why, like, how do, how is this normally handled in other places that have debates? Um, the thing is, is the base structure we're using is used for debate tournaments. Um, where, to be quite frank about it, it, it looks like, from my research, again, I just did a crash course like on this myself. I, I'm not an expert at all. John Sullivan, who I don't think is in the room, uh, actually did both high school and college, and at graduate level, he did judging at these debate tournaments, so he knows a lot about it. But I was talking to him about it at lunch as well, and it was, it, they, they, the, the policy position is all, almost moot, right? You, you just, the, the, you're graded and you're judged on how well you construct your argument. And that's who wins is not necessarily who uh, the right side. And so, and so I, I don't know if that format is right for us because we're not trying to do that. But that's the format that is typically used for formal debates. What if instead what we do, if, if we do it again, and there are a lot of ifs contained in that, but if we do it again, what if we have a presentation on a certain topic and follow with a debate related to that presentation? Yeah. Raise your hand if you think that would be a good idea. Okay. So. You may also have situations where in tournaments, the members of the audience are not going to have strongly held personal opinions about the thing being debated. In this room, almost everyone will. So, so on the collab sessions, um, I think that any of the, anything that we bring up that is going to be meaningfully advanced within within 25 or 40 or 50 minutes is going to be too simple for this group and any and anything else is not going to be meaningfully advanced within that time time frame um, I think that the collab sessions would be better used in uh, better used in in other ways okay sure Karen were, were you thinking like a fishbowl type format when you were asking about well, it. Well, you're, you're getting close to it, not necessarily fishbowl directly, but more of sort of an unconference thing. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess that, that's one idea. The other idea, going, going Van, at what you were saying, is, I mean, honestly, it, you, you remember the, the open source think tanks where we would go and you, you could spend a couple hours break up into groups, work on some problems, and then everybody comes back and presents stuff. That would be another format, which is a huge deviation from anything you've ever done here, but which people might be interested in if we have problem statements that are of the right magnitude. I, I, I think, Jim, you're kind of agreeing with Van that it needs more time. It's, it's, it's okay. either trivial or it needs a lot more time. Raise your hand if you have burning feedback on today that you absolutely really want to give us, because I also want to give us a second if anyone wants us to address any topics of the day, which this has traditionally been the purpose of the panel, and I'm cognizant that some people may have stayed for that. I don't know. But we want to hear important feedback um, if folks feel like there are points that haven't been shared. But we're also very happy to get feedback by email um, or, or in more public places to whatever you feel comfortable with. Thank you. Thank you. Aww. <laughs> we have 20 minutes left. So we, we have, so we have 20 minutes left and uh, I turn to Richard Fontana because uh, I think he's a good person to decide what things we might talk about for the remaining uh, 20 minutes of this panel. Oh, I don't know why you think that. I mean, there's so much that we could talk about. So many, so many exciting uh, issues. Well, not or we so could difficult. Ask. Yeah, we can ask Which questions. Ask? Pam Chestick. Uh, yeah. Wait. <laughs> I have no exercise today. This is great. So, moved in closer. <laughs> as, no, it's way, way too much trouble to move. As, as four highly experienced um, peop people involved in uh, open source for many, many, many years, 
I'm curious what your perspective is on two things in particular, the ethical, the ethical licenses and commercial open source and whether you see this as something that is very different and groundbreaking or whether this is same old, same old, we've been here before. Oh, um, I guess I, I can start. Um, so it, it's not new. Um, n neither thing is new. We've had um, ethical li licenses that are sort of aimed at kind of ethical or social policy problems that kind of are that look a little bit like free software, like what we've thought of as free software or open source licenses. Um, those are the, the debates over those have happened at various times in the past. I think the what's different now it, to me is um, it just feels like a louder kind of thing. Like there's more, and and I think it's less marginal. So so it's less marginalized. So it's it's being treated seriously by people who I wouldn't see as being on the fringes, but rather are kind of like very much within the. The, the central part of what I think of as the, the kind of FOSS um, community. And as for the, the commercial open source, um, I mean, that doesn't seem new either. What, what, I, what kind of annoys me, and I think I actually got this maybe originally from, from, um, from Josh, uh, something that I heard Josh say once, is that, that um, the people who are advocating for what's called, what I think you mean by commercial open source, are kind of trying to piggyback on the, the ethical uh, source you know, sort of trying to, to um, appropriate their, uh, you know, their, their political viewpoint for uh, basically making a, a kind of business argument or a business model kind of argument. So that's very disturbing. Well, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not your lawyer, and this is not legal advice. <laughs> but I don't think a license is the right place to try and promote ethics. I think that it's an, a license, uh, a software license needs to be as simple as possible and no simpler, really. Um, I think that what makes open source great is the ability for us to collaborate without having to ask permission. And um, well, many of these ethical aims are completely laudable, I think that the potential for pr proliferation of ethical licenses will only cause problems for us. And that was one thing that I learned uh, or really stood out in my mind from the debates today is that we could have a variety of ethical licenses and then they will all be incompatible with each other and our compatibility will be excruciatingly painful. So I don't think that that, I don't think that, that works. I don't, I don't think it's the right way to do it. Um, and I'm gonna ask Pam to clarify, what did you mean by commercial open source? Because I don't understand the question. Companies that complain about strip mining. Strip mining. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. So I I think, you know, the short the shorthand version of Commons clause in particular is that if you sprinkle that in your open source license, it's no longer open source. Um, I think that the idea of restricting licenses use for well, I think, let's be honest, to really to discriminate against cloud providers or software as a service providers is defeating Freedom Zero, which is the, the freedom to run the program. I, I think that it's really not, uh, it's not, it, it's a goal that's not really an open source goal. It's more of a, it's more of a business goal. And if you really want to have a license like that, that's completely fine. And, and you can have a proprietary license. Just please don't try to call it open source or try to come to me and redefine what the word open source should mean. Right. I think we need public processes around it. I mean, I think this is one of the, the, the things that I really like about licenses that have been drafted in a community process. It's one of the things I like, actually. I, I really like about the OSI review license review process is that that's done in a public way with with input, I think that the draft. I, I I think that having more drafting processes that are groups. I mean, so to for my view on the um, ethical licensing, and I'm I'm leading a discussion on Monday um, at Copyleft Conf. Uh, little plug in case you don't know about it. It's a it's a one day conference uh, on Monday. Copyleftconf.org, um, and. Uh, my, 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 my view on it, which I'll be more coy about there because I'm more leading a discussion, is that I think it reflects our utter failure as a movement to be leaders in like 
for ethical technology. Like, I think that we identified that there is something special about software freedom, that there's something special about the ethics of technology. And we got on board early, right? We were like some of the first people to start talking about it. And then you start seeing TV shows like Silicon Valley spoofing companies using our rhetoric. And so much of that is that we failed to really draw a of, of a clear line and we fail to lead. And there's this idea that while there are all these problems and we have the sense that licensing may be able to take care of some of that. And so why can't we use this and embrace it and go to the next level? And I think that we as a software freedom community, both the existing old guard and, um, and everyone new who's expressing an interest now can come together and take the best ideas of some of these, these things and start thinking from, from scratch and not throwing away anything that we have before, certainly. But, um, but you know, seeing if any of those ideas are good for any other initiatives that aren't necessarily licensing. Yeah, to, to the first part of your question, Pam, which was, is this new? I agree with Fontana. It is, it is so unnew that it's, it's ridiculously old. Uh, the first time I saw a modification of GPL to say not for military use, I think was 1996, but it was no later than 1998 of people trying to do that. And the first time I saw, uh, you know, basically non-commercial use only, source available licenses was when I was an undergraduate in like 92, 93. Uh, it was very common in academic communities. They would put software out, non-commercial use only, and hope to get some sort of contractual funding for the commercial use. So those things have been around for a while. I think the difference now um, is uh, really a failure, uh, like Karen was saying, a failure of leadership, uh, and, but I have a, sli a slightly different way of looking at it. I think the community that understood why clear licensing was important and definitions of what licenses should do was important, um, was not very connected with a generation of software developers that kind of came up in the late 2000s. And yeah, I mean, I think, how many people in the room are, would consider themselves primarily a JavaScript developer? There's actually two in the room. I, I was expecting to get three. I was expecting to get zero. Um, because there's really, because we never connected with that community in the way that we should have as, as like free software activists. Uh, and there's a ton of different things that went wrong because of that, because we didn't take them seriously, and that was our fault. And that was another way the leadership was bad uh, historically in FOSS. Hi. I think there are... Oh, yeah. go, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So one question related here is that uh, the ethical licenses seem to be following a code of conduct kind of behavior, trying to enforce a code of conduct for the corporate user community or provider community, if you want it, while trying to defend against abusive, for some reason, behavior by these corporations against others or in the community or as isolationists. So how have we been able to enforce our codes of conduct in user communities in the past? Well, well, codes of so so project codes of conduct haven't been, as I understand them, haven't been targeted ag uh, against participation outside of a project itself. So there there's been this assumption that you you can uh, you can if you're a copyright owner you can police um, behavior that falls outside the scope of the license, um, but. But codes of conduct are, are things that only apply to in activity within a project or activity at a project's uh, event, for example, at a conference like this one. Um, so I think that, that maybe that, that kind of distinction may frustrate some, some people who, um, you know, they, they, they see this, the, I would say the success of um, the adoption of codes of conduct by projects, but they see a gap between, you know, what those cover and the way the software is being used um, in a much larger sphere outside of the project itself. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sympathetic, actually, to um, a lot of the, the people who are talking about you know, ethical licenses. I, I, I agree with what others have said that, that you know, I, I don't feel that, that licenses are a good mechanism. Um, I, I don't currently believe that, um, that these kinds of licenses should be considered free software licenses. Um, but but I, I do I, I think that 
I have a lot of sympathy, and and um, I feel that what I don't know what what others here think, but I, I, as I said before, I think that what's different now is that this is not um, this is not a fringe thing. This is like there are people who are speaking out about this issue who are at, uh, really at the very center of of this this movement. Um, this question is for you, Karen, because you sort of mentioned uh, better. Yes, cool. Uh, you sort of mentioned the sort of the, the ethical core of the free software movement that got a lot of people interested, and in how it feels like maybe in some ways it's failed or it's moved away from that. Um, and this is a big issue that we are seeing in the software industry. Uh, I'd like to hear more about, you know, do you? Do you feel like this issue still sits within the free software community and the organizations advocating for it? And if so, what sort of role do you envision these organizations playing? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because saying this issue is tough. There are so many issues that are being raised, and I don't know. But the intersection from between um, our software and our lives is the critical part of where we operate. And, you know, for and you asked me, so uh, I assume it's in part because I work at Software Freedom Conservancy and I advocate for software freedom as a um, you know public good. Um, so I, I'll, I'll say in that, like if in if in Conservancy's judgment that the, it, we're not talking about um, critical issues that affect people's lives and that are essential for us to have a, a better you know situation with our technology then I don't then I assume that we in conservancy's board would decide not to work on those issues so to me I think where software touches all these issues I think they're critically important and I think we need to think about them and that's why you know um, I've tried to work on things like contract patch and getting people to talk about their employment agreements and thinking creatively about all the different ways that we can the the main thing about what I try to do and we try to do is to think about like what pragmatic activities can we do to address the issue at hand? Um, and you know that's been in sort of our our role in our niche. And so we're we're kind of like project based, you know. Like, and I think that's true of some of our member projects too. And we have a very close relationship with like Outreachy, for example, because where we see inequity, that's a project that um, that we you know we we are we are a little more involved in than even just our normal member project. So. Um, you know, and have a real partnership there. So, I, you know, this is a very blathering non-answer, actually, as I listen to myself talk. Um, but I would say we have to be active here because otherwise, what are we doing? Oh, so who else wants to? Yeah, hello. Uh, so following back uh, on today, and you've been participating in a lot of things, um, just to ask a question about like the, um, the politics of open source that we've seen today, right? And uh, first, I highly respect, I discover more and more about your background and what you've done over the last years, and, and I totally respect that. Uh, but let's say from a lot of the people, people who spoke, like there is a big, um, let's say, Indirect, direct or indirect link to big corporation funding, right? At some point, and and we we can state that they've done great things also f to contribute to open source. But my question, as you are a leader, thought leaders in this space, and for all the thought leaders in that space, say what are the guarantees the community takes to be sure to always be independent in ethics with this? I'm sure. I think we can keep our ethics. We even with we are funded with. Uh, whatever funds the thing. But what are the guarantees the community have, has taken over time and what are the, the current ones today, if I'm understood well? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I, th I think that it's a, it's a really tough question. I, for me, in my experience, you know, when I first got involved with free software, it was almost exclusively volunteers. And now there are a lot of people that are you know, that do open source as their day job. And I think that's great. Um, and, you, you know, you bring up a question of what, what does that influence mean, you know, for the movement? And, you know, I think that it's a, it's a tough question, but I, I actually think that, you know, stepping back, we're at a moment in our, in our movement where we're being challenged by the definition of our movement 
at all. What is it that free? What does free software mean? What does open source mean? And, and uh, you know, one of the things that we heard earlier today is that our original notions of this that we got written down are, you know, quite quite old, twenty years old. And so, answering your question about ethics, I think has to. We even have to, you know, think of what is the evolution of our movement and what does it mean. I, I, I think that that can answer your question. I, for me, I'm really motivated by the idea of collaboration and not having to ask permission and uh, maybe some classic notions of software freedom. Um, and I think that it's tricky to see how that's going to evolve with all the things that have put pressure on us, like network computing and... Um, uh, and, and such things. So it's it's a it's a tough question, but I think that we even have a bigger question, which is, how are we defining what we're doing, and how are we educating people that are that are new into caring about what it is that we care about? Yeah, I, I appreciate you mentioning politics, Mitty. I, I, Karen often tells me to stop saying that fundamentally the work that at least I do, not so much as she does, is is basically being a politician. Uh, but the free software and open source has become a political process. Um, it's the worst kind of political process in a lot of ways because, we, as you mentioned, we have all these companies that have this influence. Nobody elected them. They, they don't represent the community. And nobody elected me either. We at Conservancy, we have a self-perpetuating board. Um, the OSI deserves credit for being basically the only organization in our community that actually holds an election and goes to the people. You know. Um, the, but let's let's put that aside for a moment. Um, I, I think it's great that they run an election and they actually get votes uh, and respect the votes of, of their constituency. Um, and and we need more of that kind of republic, uh, re small r republic, kind of representation. Debian is another great example. That's a It's the only free software project that's a constitutional republic. Um, and, and, so, and so we have this weird political structure which is just ripe for corruption because there's corp corporations floating around hiring people and people go to work for companies even though they're technically working on a project. And we have not solved any of that political complication. And I work on it every day and I really don't even know if I understand how it works and how to fix it and how to make it better. Uh, so so I, it's, it's really tough. Uh, I, I don't know what to do about it. But I, I recognize this is what you're raising is a huge problem. So first, thank you for this session, because I think it's the most interesting session of the day. Um, thank you. One point on my side, uh, as a, a European person, uh, I'm a bit uh, not finding everything I would like to find in this type of session, because I like the European vision as well, in addition to a more US-centric vision of the law. So I would like, for example, the Google versus Oracle case, I would love to see what does the Supreme Court result means for us in Europe? What does it mean for us? What, what, what would be the consequences? Is there any impact for us as well? And for all the rest of the day, I would also like to have in the board with you some European lawyers that could bring an additional uh, set of information around what, what, what you are bringing, which is already great. Don't, don't take me wrong. So a couple of points. Um, your, your question is re very apropos. I think it would be really great to have an analysis of what um, uh, Oracle v. Google would mean specifically to the European Union. That's a, it's a fabulous question. We have, throughout the history of the Dev Room, we've really tried hard to represent a diversity of views, and diversity not just of Europeans uh, and uh, people from all around the world, but also from women and underrepresented people. So, uh, and you, you saw European lawyers up today. You heard uh, Miriam's cross-examination. She, she's brilliant. That was great. Um, and we've had, uh, you know, other... Um, uh, yeah, there's like six or seven. Yeah, so we, we had a variety. It could be better, and I, I, take that, I take that point. And I do want to go further and acknowledge that one of the, the campaigns that I most admire in Europe is uh, public, you know, code, uh, you know, public money, public code. I think that this is a great message, and this is uh, something that can articulate what we care about to a broader audience. And and I think that that, that message, and talking to my fellow Europeans, has has been 
uh, well received. I think people in the general population get that message more readily than the equivalent Americans. So. I love the like cross jurisdictional aspect of your question, and I I think if we do this again, we should absolutely see because we we do a CFP, but we wind up not getting as many submissions or all, all along the things that we think should be addressed. So we'll work hard to encourage people to submit on topics that evaluate these cases in a cross jurisdictional way. I really like that. There's another question, and yeah, I, I just want to say, as I often do when I travel outside the U.S. Um, I apologize for my country and the policies that it exports around the world. <laughs> I was born there. It wasn't my fault. To People in the stream are screaming, Kelly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure. So, uh, Okay. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll pass Philippe the, the microphone a little bit later for him to make his point. There was a question here. It, it's not a question. I, I would like to, to answer what does Oracle v. Google mean in the European Union. So the European Copyright Directive on Computer Programs explicitly excludes interfaces from being copyrightable to, uh, to foster interoperability. So... At least from my view, there wouldn't be such a case in Europe. Google could just have taken the interface. And Do you think the mic? Yeah, just make sure you're on the mic and speaking, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just there is a case, the SAS case, the it, in the ECJ. I think that is directly on point on what your comment. It's interesting to imagine if the ECJ rules one way and the Supreme Court rules a different way, <laughs> that's going to make our life even more complicated. We have three minutes. Uh, okay, Philippe wanted to say something. Okay, okay. So. Uh, my question, following up on uh, what you said about what could be new ways for the free software movement to uh, not really reinvent itself, but like find uh, an identity that matters now. You mentioned just now public money, public code, but in general, the starting from the free, for freedoms uh, or the open source definition, all the definitions of the free software movement have been very much focused on what uh, uh, could be uh, appealing to developers. Uh, do you think that we miss we missed an opportunity to involve the users? Yes, yes, yes. And I agree with you. I agree with everything you're about to say. Yes. No, no. I was going to say when and how and what could we do now. It's only questions. You cannot agree with them. <laughs> well, I, well, this is, uh, you know, kind of a, a subject that's close to my heart, which is how can we give users standing in free software culture and hardware and one you know one of the challenges that we have especially in considering open hardware licenses is that the end user that receives a product doesn't have standing to insist on the source and i i think we need to you know i think we need to involve users i like that this might be a good thing to discuss next year if we have a room philippe did you want to follow up it was covered. Yep. Okay. <laughs> it was discussed before. One Thank more you. question, or uh, so. Again, great thanks for all this wonderful talk, and please applaud to the wonderful. <laughs> yes. And I personally looking forward to what you have in store for us for next year. 10th anniversary session, right? Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, I know it's, been, it's, a, it's a long day. It's a hard building to get to, and we really appreciate your input. Um, oh, you thank can, you for getting your shoes muddy. Yeah. Um, you can find at least my email address on the FOSTA mailing list where we let out the CFP, and I'd love to get your feedback if you didn't have a chance to get your question or thought in. And before you leave today, if you could, we could ask you a favor to look down and pick up any trash that you find and deposit it in the trash bins that are on either side of the room and help us clean up. That would be great.
I just want to point out that last year was our 1-0 anniversary in Octal anyway, so it's already happened. And wait, one last applause for Tom Marvel, the amazing Tom Marvel.